Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American. Nineteen twenty-three. A young man is born in Mannheim, Germany. His father's in the cigar business. This young man is with me today, but this young man has gone through a living hell. This man has gone through a variety of things, and this is an interesting life, probably one of the most interesting lives I've ever done on Building New York, New York Life Stories. Today I have Ernest Michel who is the Emeritus Executive Vice President of UJA, Federation of New York. But more important, he's Ernest Michel, number 104-995, Auschwitz. Ernie, you're born in 1923, and then in 1936, you told me, you go to school, and the teacher says, you can't come here anymore. What happened? He was a very nice guy. I was sitting in the audience with all my fellow schoolmates. He told me, Ernst Michel, please stay until everybody's gone. I have to tell you something. But I was 13 years old, and uh, he asked me to come up front. He was a very nice man. He put his hands on my shoulder. I'll never forget it. His name was Mr. Christ. He was beginning tomorrow, you won't be able to go to school anymore. Why? I'm all right. I'm on the soccer team. I'm playing. I'm all right. I enjoy it. It's not that. Beginning tomorrow, all German boys and girls are no longer permitted to go to school. That was the first shock that I had when I realized what Hitler was doing to the Jews in Germany. Fast forward, we go to 1938. 1938, you have a younger sister, Lottie, and in 1938, your parents are worried about Lottie, and your parents find a home for her. What happens? My sister was five years younger than I am, and uh, she was able to go on a children's transport to France. That was before the war. There was a German, you know, they were t we were dealing with each other. She went to, uh, to Strasbourg. My father took a train to take her. She was 11. 
10, 11 years old, one person at least was able to get out of Germany. As you said to me, you had a pen pal in America, and the pen pal was writing with you, and his father, and you were trying, you and your father were trying to get you a visa to leave Germany. What happened? I met uh, that man on the street. He was the first time I've seen an American car, and they seemed to be lost. Now, I spoke a little bit of English. My father had taught me, talked to me about it. And uh, I come there, and I said, can I help you? He said, we want to go to Heidelberg, and we are lost. Oh, that's easy. You just turn around, and you go straight directly. And there's a sign, Autobahn. And uh, that was it, maybe a two-minute meeting. As they were leaving, he says, hold it a moment. I want to know how old are you? Well, I'm 16 years old. Oh, I have a son in Wilmington, Delaware. Have you ever heard of it? Never heard of it. And uh, would you like to have a, to correspond with him, to write to him? Your English is not bad for a young kid who goes to school. And uh, that's how, uh, how it went. And that man eventually, long story short, arranged for an affidavit for me. My father wrote to him in Wilmington, Delaware, do you know any a Jewish family that might be able, willing to- To sponsor uh, you. To, uh, to vouch for me. And that led to an affidavit, unfortunately, the head of the, uh, at the, uh, the State Department, the visa section. When you and your father went to visit him. Went to visit him. We had to wait till 1942, in the middle of World War II. I never was able to get to this country. 1939, you're sent to a work camp, correct? That was the first camp I went to. And then 1943, you're sent to Auschwitz. That's right. You arrive in Auschwitz, Dr. Mengele is there, and Dr. Mengele is making a determination who goes to the right, who goes to the left. Fortunately, you went to the right. That's right. And when you go to Auschwitz, I remember in the book, they shaved everyone's hair, they took all your possessions and everything, and then they put on your arm the tattoo. 104 and 995, That's what which I later think. on is a very interesting story. So now you're in Auschwitz, and it, a very interesting thing happens. A German soldier hits you on the head, and you end up in the infirmary. You really read my book. Uh, very much. And so you go into the infirmary, and this communist who was in the infirmary, who was not a Jew, this communist in the infirmary asks a question of who has a good handwriting. That's right. <laughs> and, and the good situation was when you, before you went to the labor camp in 1939, your father said to you, Ernest, learn calligraphy. <laughs> yeah. And he, I thought you, you didn't know what he was talking about. And he said, Dad, he says, learn calligraphy. And what does this 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 communist want you to do? I was injured, and it was uh, there was no hospital, but an infirmary. And he came in. Anybody has a good handwriting. I remembered my father sending me to cal learn calligraphy, and I raised my hand. He said, "You want to come with me?" I went with him around the corner, and he says, "Write down in German, Herzanschlag." That means in heart attack, weak of body. We're no longer able to work. And, and basically, heart attack and weak of body, yeah. since the Nazis were so specific in their, in their record keeping, your job in the infirmary was really to say who died in the gas chamber. Because weak well, of body, and heart attack was that type of thing. You were touching a very sore point with, my, with, my, with me personally. I saved my life 
eventually, because that man had asked me to write Herzanschlag and Tweak of Body. And today, people are saying, this never happened. This is making a hoax. I have to have the number, the name, and what they died of. Nobody in Auschwitz or any of the other camps ever died of being gassed. Only Körperschwäche, weak of body, had that, that, that what I had to write. So that saved you to work in the infirmary. Right. And in the infirmary, you had other jobs, which we, you know, you had to take care of the corpses and some yes, other things. Indeed. But it's now early 1945, and the Nazis say, let's take them out because they, they're losing the war, and they put you on this death march, right? The march of the 60,000? So it's January in the worst time, and you are marching with these people. And basically, I think 30,000 people died. There were 60,000 we were in, in Auschwitz, and it was a bitter cold winter in Poland. And uh, we arrived in Gleiwitz. We were down 30,000, 50% were died, we fell apart, we couldn't make it. And Gleiwitz was what, Bergen-Belsen? No, Gleiwitz was a German city, very well known. We were all put in cattle cars, and we wound up in a place called Buchenwald. Buchenwald. Yeah. It's, it's April of 1945, and Roosevelt dies. And the Nazis, who are major trouble at this time, are, ready to, are killing people. They're just shooting people. And you had two friends. And these two friends, in April, maybe April 11th, April 12th, say, you know what, if we don't get away, and the Nazis were running away from each other anyway because yeah. they were worried, you, you said, if we don't get away, maybe I'm going to get shot. So the, two, the three of you run out to the, out to the, to the field. No, no, not quite. Uh, Actually, we put our pants down as if right. we have to do something, you know? Right. And then we looked around, and we were a little, maybe a hundred yards away, and on one signal, we started to run away. Now, security was already le less than strong, you know? People knew it was the end of the war, but they kept on with killing as if nothing ever happened before. So now, the three of you end up in a farm <laughs> and at the farm, the, the German family was happy to have some laborers to work. So then the war ends. And there's a great story in your book, and everybody should get the, this Promises book. It is a fantastic book. You, there's a story that you, you meet somebody, you meet a rabbi, but there's so much, and we only have a half an hour, that, that someone says to you, here, take the motorcycle. He gives you the motorcycle. So you can go back to Mannheim. And you go back to Mannheim to look for your family and all the rest, and there's no family. Mannheim was 80, 90 percent bombed out. And I'd been given a, a, a motorcycle by the American Army and, 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 and a piece of paper that showed that this was uh, author, uh, author, uh, agreed upon by the... That you had the right to I, take the motorcycle. So I walked the cycle. I went to Mannheim three days, and whenever I showed them the paper, you know, and they let me go and gave me gas and gave me food, and then I wound up in Mannheim. And it was nine o'clock in the evening, and I looked at my parents' home where we used to live, and it was all, all bombed out. Since there was no place to stay, the Americans allowed you to stay in the jail. In jail, yeah. So you, you, the first, the first night, night you stayed in jail. The first night in Mannheim, I wound up so, in jail. So here's the interesting thing especially since your father was helpful and told you to, to, to have a good handwriting. 1945, the end of 1945, it's Nuremberg, the trials at Nuremberg. Oh, and sure. Ernie Michel, who at this time is 22 years of age, That's right. becomes a reporter. It was the German news agency. Because it was everything in Germany came to a dead end. There was nothing. And the trial was beginning in Nuremberg. And they looked for somebody who was clean, you know, not, not, not tainted by, by the Nazis. 
and they couldn't find anybody better than a Jewish guy. I never had a job in my life. The only thing I knew, how to survive in Auschwitz. And then I became a reporter. And uh, I saw not further than, you know, a little further than you are sitting here. Goering. Hermann Goering. Hermann Goering and, yeah. and, and the rest of the, the, all, the animals, all, all of the animals. All the 21 defendants. And I wanted to jump down sometime. I says, why did you do that? What had I done? Why did you kill my parents? Which I'm sure my parents weren't, li weren't living. And I found out later on they had been killed in Auschwitz two years uh, one year before I got there. So now, and you're there with the legendary Edward R. Murrow, Walter Cronkite, <laughs> and, and you're writing, and, and, and there's a book of your, of all the articles that sure. you wrote, and, and the book is signed, Ernest Michel, former inmate at Auschwitz, 104-995. That's my number. So what happens after that? How do you get to America? Well, the trial was over. And uh, before that, I had made arrangements to leave Germany. I couldn't stand it anymore, although I changed my mind later on. But then I came to America. I arrived here. And then I was asking myself, what am I going to do? But wait, how do you end up in Chicago? <laughs> the, everything is a story. Because I wound up in Chicago because the man I met at the mili American military government was a lieutenant by the name of Albert Hutler. And he took me on as an interpreter. That was my first job. Not only that, he picked a house for me that I was going to live in, because the first night I, I was in jail. And uh, this is how I started my... Uh, he was in Chicago. He was in Chicago. So you go to Chicago. Yeah. You have no, you don't know, you had no family. You don't know who no, was here. all alone. So, so you go to Chicago. And then, after you're in Chicago for three days, you end up in Port Huron, Michigan? <laughs> yeah. What? Why Port Huron, Michigan? Well, <laughs> I try to get a job and love writing. I enjoy doing it. And they had me report from the trial, which I, which I wanted to do. And I got myself a job in Port Huron, Michigan. Now, in Port Huron, as I remember in the book, the publisher says, Ernie, you're a nice person. I'm happy you're here, but you can't be a writer. So he taught you to be a, a copy, boy. copy boy, a copy boy. Yeah. <laughs> and then what happens is a very interesting situation. In Port Huron, you start your 60 years of speaking publicly. What happens? The first speech. You tell me about the first speech. It was in, in, I, I never knew what I was doing. I, uh, I went there, and they asked me, we read in the newspaper, the paper took it in his column, wrote about me, so the people in Port Huron read it, and one of them came to me and said, would you be able to talk about what happened to, to you during the war in Auschwitz and the camps? And I said, well, I have never spoken in English. Uh, I, I, you know, I, just learning now how to uh, how to how to write for a newspaper, and uh, uh, they put me on the on the on the uh, on the podium, and said, uh, "Ernest Michel, you read about him in, the, in your newspaper in the Port Huron Times Herald, and uh, he would like to share with you what happened to him." And I started to talk. I, not, n I never planned anything. I never lectured in my life, you know. But here I was, and I said one word followed another and another, and I told my whole story. And about, uh, I was later told, after, uh, after an hour and a half, I couldn't talk anymore. <laughs> and they, they left. There was no applause. There was nothing. And they were so shocked by what they heard, which simply what would happen to me. And that eventually led to my becoming a speaker for the United Jewish Appeal. So how how the United Jewish Appeal find Ernie Michelle? I'll tell you what, there's another story behind it. Lieutenant Hutler, 
you know. The, Remember Mr. Lieutenant Huckler uh, in Chicago, who worked, uh, who was in Mannheim originally. That's right. Had a job with UJA. He had it. He was an official in Chicago of the local federation. Yeah. And uh, he he wrote to the who called up UJA in New York, the main office, and says, "Look, I have a recommendation for you." There's a guy who was at the Nuremberg trial. He spent four, five and a half years in the camps, and I think he is somebody who could you, you could be able to use. And uh, that led to, uh, to my become a speaker for the United Jewish Appeal in 1946, the first year after the war was over. And that led to my career with the UJA. And your career with the UJA spanned, it, it even continues today. Oh, yeah. As, I'm uh, still working uh, at it. You're still working at, at the UJA. But, but the interesting thing, you've been all over the country. Yes, you spent many years in, in the West Coast. You spent time in Utah. You, you spent time all over. And then you even went to France. You were involved with the UJA in, yes. in, 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 in France. But there, there's some interesting stories. Uh, that, that have to come out. Besides the 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 Nuremberg book, there's another book <laughs> that th this Haggadah, yeah. and the Haggadah, which we have a picture of over here, this Haggadah that you have over your lifetime, asked for signatures. Tell me about that. Uh, I was I bought that book. It was a Sheikh Haggadah. And I got it, and one day I was in Paris, and I took care of uh, Ben-Gurion. He was my responsibility as a uh, professional in the Jewish community. And uh, he, <laughs> really, it's, it's interesting that you, that, that you talk about that. Here I was taking care of Ben-Gurion, and I had that Haggadah, and I said, gee, I always love to collect things. Yeah, your father yeah, was a collector of stamps. That's and right. And that's how saved him many that's years, because he was selling the stamps to survive. That's exactly it. And, and, and I, so I came to Ben-Gurion as a Mr. Prime Minister. I have the Sheikh Haggadah, which is very well known. And I would like to ask you, would you be good enough to uh, autograph it? He said, where do you want me to sign it? Well, you pick the page. <laughs> so he signed it to Ernest Michel, David Ben-Gurion, Prime Minister of the State of Israel. So how many signatures you have oh, in it now? I, every time I went to Israel because of uh, my role as a, an executive of the United Jewish Appeal, I took the book with me. And wherever I could, I went to one of the prime ministers and the, and the minister of this department, this department, and they all signed it. And by now, as you have seen the uh, book, they have uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, autographs of the leadership of, Germ of Israel that, uh, that... Now, with a couple of minutes left, I would be totally wrong if I didn't tell the story about your return to Mannheim. <laughs> you returned to Mannheim, what, 60 years later? Sixty years later, the city of Mannheim invited me to speak at the 400th anniversary of the of, uh, of the, the founding of, of the, city. the founding of the city. And the uh, the person who was in charge told me, uh, Herr Michel, you know, he spoke German at that time. I still know how to speak it, of course. I want to show you the museum. The memorial that our city built for the Jews, for, for the Jew, for those who were killed, and he took me to it, and uh, he showed me my father's and my your mother's mother, name, my grandmother's name, who were killed in in the camps. Yeah, but the interesting thing is, how did it come out that his grandfather was the man who saved you? It's one story after another. Uh, it, uh, I wrote in my book, Promises Kept, I wrote about the fact that a uh, inmate, and that was uh, the one from a, was a communist. He was right. arrested before. The man who he, saved you. The man who saved me. He saved my life, literally. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. 
So he and saved your life and his... And he, he died. Uh, he was older than, than Ryan. But eventually, I found through the mayor, I found the name of his son who lived in uh, Houston, Texas. Stud uh, he was a professor. He was my age, a little bit younger than I was. Than, uh, than I was. And he, uh, when I called up the telephone number, which was given to me by the mayor, <laughs> I called up and I said, are you the son of Stefan Hyman? He says, who are you? Well, I want to talk to you. Uh, I don't want to talk to anybody whom I, whom I know, who I mean, don't, don't, whom I don't know. I said, look, here is an opportunity for something to come up. And I told the Dieter Hyman on the telephone, your father saved my life. He says, well, it's impossible. It's impossible because my, nobody knows my father. He says, well, I knew your father. How did you know my father? I knew your father in Auschwitz. And that's how, I, uh, how my life was saved. Your father was responsible for the fact that I'm sitting here today. And the fact that you're sitting here today, and the fact that you've spoken for UJA, and you've spoken around the world, and the fact that you have the Shikh Haggadah, and you have the, 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 the Nuremberg book, and the fact that we can tell the story is that people should never forget that this happened. And I'd like to thank you for being here today. It's a privilege to be able to, to share some of the things that happened to me, and thank you for inviting me. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman, LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American. <laughs>